Winner, winner, chicken dinner, which plot of cucumbers did the best? The one with the most compost or the one with the least? That's what we're gonna find out today. If you missed that first video, let me bring you up to speed really quick. We had five test plots. Each of those test plots had different levels of compost applied to them, ranging from no compost to six inches thick of compost. I transplanted cucumber plants into all of those beds, and today we're gonna find out which one actually did better. So, what's better, more or less compost? Which plants did better? Well, I'll get to that in a little bit, but before we get to that, let's talk about what people predicted and what I think some of the thoughts were behind those predictions. Overwhelmingly, you all, the viewers, picked beds three, four, and five to do the best, and it's probably more skewed towards four and five to do the best. So that's implying that public think, group think, says that more compost is better. More compost is a good thing. More compost means more plant growth. And that may be right, and that may be wrong. We'll find out in a little bit. But we have to think about what's at the heart of those predictions. Why did the group predict more compost is better? Is more compost actually better? And I think to answer that, we need to ask the question of, what is compost? Compost is really pure organic matter. There's not a lot of minerals in there. There's not a lot of particles in there. You're not getting your sand, silt, and clay in compost. You're not getting bits of rock in compost. At the core, really what compost is, is pure organic matter that's been broken down and stabilized into a form that we know as compost. It's not the same exact thing as soil. And if it's not the same thing as soil, then should plants grow the same in compost as they do in pure soil? And if it's pure organic matter, can plants actually thrive and grow in pure organic matter? I mean, look around in nature. What types of plants or organisms grow in pure organic matter? Not really many plants, woody plants or herbaceous plants. A lot of the organisms growing in pure organic matter are things like fungi. So maybe that's a little hint towards which one of these beds did better. Given that compost is pure organic matter, we also have to think about the organic matter itself. There's degrees of organic matter, from things like wood chips to grass clippings to compost. They're all organic matter, but they're at various different stages of decomposition. So we can't just say that we're growing in pure organic matter. We kind of have to classify where is that organic matter in the breakdown scale of things. How compost actually is that compost. And not all composts are actually created equal. In fact, the compost that I use, the Kellogg's Amend, it's composted wood chips. And it's not fully broken down compared to other types of compost that you can buy out there in the market. If I compare it to something like Malibu Compost Booze Blend, which you can see right here, that's actually a really fine texture. It's very broken down. It's much closer to what would eventually become humus and soil. Then on the other side here, you see the Kellogg's Amend. You can clearly see this was made out of wood chips. You can pick out the ingredients that went into this, quote, compost. So it's not as broken down. So I'm not gonna say all composts are created equal. And I realize that may be skewing some of the results in this experiment. Because if you have compost that isn't fully broken down, what's the problem with that? Well, one, it might still be in the composting process. It might still be breaking down. And when organic matter breaks down, it exudes all types of things like there's acids and enzymes that the microorganisms are using to break down that organic matter. They're not always plant friendly or root friendly. You're also gonna have a different microbiome and compost that's breaking down versus compost that already has broken down versus in the soil. I mean, just think about your compost pile. You build it big and tall in your yard. The organisms that come out of the air and are on that material find their way to that pile. They start breaking it down. They're decomposer organisms. If you take that pile and then you put it on top of your soil. You've inoculated your soil with microorganisms, but what microorganisms primarily did you just add to that soil? You added decomposing microorganisms because that's what was in the pile. Well, what's typically in the soil? Sure, there's decomposing microorganisms in the soil that break down things like root mass and other organic matter that ends up in the soil, but there's also a lot of plant assisting microorganisms, things like mycorrhizal fungi and other nematodes and bacterias that work with plants 
to help plants thrive. So you're going to have a different microbiome in compost than you will in soil. And you're also going to potentially have different microbiomes in that compost, depending on how broken down that compost is. So if you're just adding compost to the soil, you're adding pure organic matter, you're adding organisms that came from the compost pile, you're not adding soil based organisms directly to the soil surface that could immediately assist in plant growth. Again, maybe a hint as to which one of these did better. Another big issue that I saw doing this experiment with the compost that I was using was water holding capacity. I know you might be saying, well, compost holds a lot of water. Organic matter holds X times its weight in terms of water. That may be true, but what holds more water per weight than organic matter? Clay does, and a lot of soils have a lot of clay in them, at least they do out here. So if we're working with a clay loam soil versus a sandier soil, well, clay loam is gonna have a high water holding capacity. Compost that isn't fully broken down or some compost might not be able to hold as much water as that clay. So one thing I actually had trouble doing was keeping a lot of water in some of these compost heavy test plots, meaning four and five. You kind of think that's anti-intuitive, but that's just how it worked. The, the compost almost act to be hydrophobic in some cases. They don't want to absorb water and send they kind of push it away. Think about peat moss, pure organic matter. But when you go to wet peat moss, if you just take peat moss and drop it in water, what's going to happen? It's just going to float on top of the water and it's going to take a while for the peat to actually absorb that water. With unfinished compost and some compost, you might actually see that effect. So you might actually have trouble getting water into the compost and into the soil if you have that hydrophobic effect happening, depending on what your compost is actually made out of and what state of decomposition it's actually at. The other big thing I think people missed in this was when you add compost to the top of the soil surface, what are you actually doing? And this isn't a trick question. You're adding compost to the top of the soil surface. It takes time for those two layers to blend. You've created this kind of disruption layer where, as I said before, the organisms from the top and the organisms from the bottom have to merge and blend together. Those two layers have to come together. It's like putting frosting on a cake or maybe a better way of saying it is, it's like those Italian restaurants or so-called Italian restaurants that take pasta, they cook it, and then they just pour sauce over the top of it and they serve that to you and they call you that authentic Italian spaghetti. And my Italian grandfather would be rolling over in his grave if he was served spaghetti like that because sauce on top of pasta is not spaghetti. You gotta cook the noodles with the sauce to make a good spaghetti. The same thing applies here with compost and soil. If you just pour it on top, Yes, it will eventually soak in. Yes, it will eventually integrate, but that takes time. And you are creating a different boundary layer there that the soil organisms need to work through in order to have good growth. Same thing with the plants you're planting in there. So I could make the argument, even in kind of a no-till operation, that maybe you rough up the surface a little bit and try to integrate that compost at least a little ways into the soil versus just layer caking it up higher, eventually ending up somewhere in the sky. If we put all this together and really think about it, why did most people say that beds three, four, and five would do the best in the clash of the compost? I think at the heart of it, there's this idea that compost is good, like we've been taught, add compost, add compost, add compost, but we're missing the context. And I hope the early part of this video helped outlay some of that context. All compost is different. Compost won't immediately be effective. But the other main thing I think people focus on, and this is in the farming world, the gardening world, the homesteading world, and even in large scale agriculture, is they focus on the top six inches of the soil and improving that. And they forget about everything below. And over the last few months, and I will continue to do so in the future, I've done a lot of videos to try and emphasize the point that it's not just the top six inches of soil that matter. You have to build deep soils to have long-term productive soils. And this isn't a Diego thing. This is something the NRCS talks about. A lot of soil scientists really push very hard is you got to be thinking deeper. So by adding something to the soil surface, you're improving the soil surface. 
but you're not building deep soils. And how do you build deep soils? Well, you build deep soils through roots by putting plants in the soil and having those roots go deep down into the soil. So inherently, whenever you put plants into the soil, you start building soil and we, we maximize, maybe we overemphasize the value of adding compost and we underemphasize the value of the plants in, that are growing in that compost in terms of building soil. So we skew in favor of compost and we minimize plant growth, but both are important to grow plants. I'm not here to say adding stuff to the soil surface is bad, whether it's wood chips, straw, compost. It's good and it's needed, but it's only one piece of the picture. You need to think beyond that. So this focus on compost and adding something to the soil, this focus on the top six inches is why I think most people really picked test case number five, the one that got the most compost to do the best. So the results, which one actually did the best. Drum roll. The winner of the clash of the compost was actually bed number one. If we just do a visual inspection of these, bed number one, I think, did the best. Bed number four, I think, came in second. And then we have bed number two, bed number three, and bed number five. You don't actually see plants in bed number five. Why is that? Well, those plants actually hung on through this week and they finally died off earlier this week. I had a lot of trouble actually keeping the, that bed moist. I think the soil just wasn't a good soil. Well, it wasn't even soil. I think the compost wasn't a great compost to have plants put into from day one. Those transplants were just too fragile with the 90 plus degree days we've been having. They had a hard time of it. Well, all the other beds did really good. So water was an issue in there and probably the components of that compost were just not favorable to plant growth. So why did bed number one do so well when nothing is actually added to it? Well, it might have had pretty decent soil to start with. That soil might not have been starved and this is maybe an error I think a lot of people made and their assumption was how good is our soil to start with? Because in decent to great soil, Adding compost might not make a huge difference. It might only get a little bit of a bump, but you have hard packed clay or really terrible soil. Well, compost is gonna make a difference. So you need to be thinking about and asking the question, if you're gonna be adding a lot of compost is, how good is my soil to start with? If it's good, you're probably only getting a small bump. If it's bad, you're probably gonna be getting a better longer term bump from the compost itself. So I could have had pretty good soil actually to start with in bed number one or really across all these beds. So the plants, as soon as they were put in the ground, they could just go to work and do what they do best, do what their genetics program to do, grow tall, reproduce, and try and take over the world. Where the compost bed, that plant got in there and it was like, I'm struggling. I don't know what to do here. This isn't the best soil. I don't even know if I'm gonna live past my early infancy and get to the point where I can even think about reproducing. I wanna be that randy teenager of a plant. So not all soil can get exponentially better with compost additions, but keep in mind, this is only a short period of time and we've done this experiment for one month or 30 days. So how much can 30 days tell us? Well, it can't tell us a lot. And if we were to continue this experiment over the next year, bed five might eventually do the best as that compost layer integrates more into the soil and it becomes topsoil. I'm not gonna continue the experiment for a year, but I think we could say that that could be a scenario that could happen. The base principles here that I really want people to take home are to think about how good is your soil? What are you working with? And what's the best way to get more organic matter into that soil? Maybe it's from compost addition and maybe it's not. Maybe it's from adding plants and maybe it's some combination of both. You have to do what works best in your context to improve the soil, to suppress weeds, to encourage plant growth, and to retain moisture in the soil. That's probably some combination on a gardening scale of adding a mulch, be it wood chips, straw, or compost to the soil surface, along with providing a living plant cover that covers the soil and puts living roots into the soil. 
but don't be so reliant on the compost. Don't add so much because you're probably adding too much. And don't always be thinking about just improving those top six inches. Be thinking bigger, be thinking deeper, and give plants the credit they deserve for their ability to build soil. Hope you enjoyed this experiment over the past 30 days. I think it was a good one. I mean, give it a try on your garden beds. If you're somebody who's dumping mounds and mounds of compost on really good soil, maybe cut back on the, soil, the compost application a little bit and see how those beds change. You know, try some stuff. Don't be afraid to challenge the norms, challenge public perception, which is kind of what I did in this case because public perception was saying, just add a whole bunch of compost. And don't be afraid to be wrong or make a fool out of yourself. If you wanna make improvements, if you wanna make new discoveries, you have to be fearless in doing this stuff. You can't be afraid of somebody saying you're wrong or that's not gonna work or just having a bed not work. In order to make advancements, you have to make mistakes. And making mistakes and putting yourself out there takes some courage, so go after it. Be a citizen scientist, make some mistakes, try some stuff, know why you're doing what you're doing, and arrive at the best solution for you. Don't just copy what somebody else told you. Thanks for watching this video. Until next time, be nice, be thankful, and do the work.